on on your exams. Um, you know, feel free to, to, to stop after class and we go over uh, questions for you. I mean, I think I don't think there was any one question that you know uh, everybody did poorly on uh, by any means. Um, if I needed to look through, I think everybody did uh, did pretty well on the first one. Um, the second question here. We see a lot of mistakes here and there, but I think in general everybody did pretty well. Um, the uh, what was the one question with the apparent reflectance? The second one, yeah, apparent reflectance. Um, a lot of folks got to that point and didn't get the apparent reflectance um, portion of that rate, but just um, you know, for the future, remember that apparent reflectance is the, the ratio of the radiance reaching the sensor to the radiance reaching the top of the atmosphere. So it's as if the reflector was at the top of the Earth's atmosphere, sitting right at that point. Okay. It's a quantity that gets used not all that often, um, but it does get used uh, in certain situations. So um, if you missed that one, uh, it's, you know, it's described in the text, and I can go over that with you uh, after the fact also. Uh, folks did pretty well on, um, on the error propagation one. A couple folks didn't propagate all the terms through. You know, there's four terms that you need to propagate the error through on uh, that one. Uh, as far as the big equation went, folks did fine on that one. And uh, let's see, the, the seven uh, Q's error photo interpretation, everybody did good on that one. And uh, like I said, I think three people got all the links. <laughs> so I, I, uh, I feel slightly uh, vindicated that I'm not the only one in the world that doesn't know all these. But I know them now. So like I said, if you have any questions you know, about uh, your testing video, just you know, stop by after class and go over oh. uh, All right, so what I'm going to do today is, is start up on chapter 6 in the text. Um, and there's a lot of material in, in this particular chapter on, um, in, in the text, we don't go through it all. Um, particularly, there's some examples of, of actual sensors that are in use today. Um, what I'd like to do in here is really just do a more general overview of the types of sensors that are out there. And you know, here and there we'll add a, a name, but there's so many sensors, you know, I'll, I'll miss you know, a whole bunch of them as uh, I try to give all the examples of all. But we'll look at them just pretty much. In all right, so. We're in, let's see, as far as the, the schedule goes, I think we're, we're a little like a half, a half a lecture behind the outline, but that's okay. We're going to be able to make that up. Um, Monica's going to come in at the end of the class to go over the next laboratory, um, which will be due on the 26th, so two and a half weeks from now. Um, and, and I think she's going to bring your, lab, your first lab reports back um, to class, so you have those uh, before you all right, so, are we going Any questions? Did we have a good break? Mm -hmm. I don't remember the last time I had three weeks off. It was <laughs> glorious. <laughs> All right, so let me uh, just start the sharing. sensors uh, that are out there. Um, okay, so and really, I, said, I, I would guess if there was, if I had to divide them into three distinct classes of sensors, there is um, a focal plane array, which everybody is, is very familiar with, right? Every camera you have has a CMOS or a CCD uh, detector in there. Um, and you're used to collecting <coughs> RGB photography. Right? So everybody's very familiar with a, you know, at least the concept of a, uh, of a focal plane array. Um, the other major class is something called a line scanner. Right? And while you may not think about it very often, you're probably all used to it, and I actually don't know uh, 
How many people actually own a desktop scanner? It's kind of weird. I don't know why people don't own desktop scanners anymore, because they're still useful. Um, but you got you know, Oops. <laughs> All right, well, you and two others. <laughs> so if you, uh, if you have a, a desktop scanner, and if, have you ever opened it up and watched it? Of course you have, right? You put your face on it and stuff like that. Um, you'll notice that there's a, a, um, just a bar inside there that, that moves down across the page, right? And that's all that is is a linear array of detectors that samples the page one element at a time. Normally, the, uh, the scanners that you have on your desktop are, are probably 2048 um, detector elements across. Some of them will scan 8192s and resampling. But usually, that's about the, the extent of the array size. Um, and that's really just limited by what people think they can sell it for, right? And if you put an 8192 linear detector in there, it'll be a lot more expensive than Fifty dollars that people are willing to spend for a, a scanner. Um, all right, so so that's just a, a line scanner, and there's an equivalent that we use um, in remote sensing. Uh, well, there's several equivalents that we use, and we'll go over those different architectures. And then the simplest, I guess, as far as detector technology would go, um, of the imaging systems is something called a line scanner. And these are more rare um, now. I would say 10 years ago, they weren't as rare. There was quite a few of these around, but they've, they've become more rare. But they still have a very important place in, in remote sensing, especially, because they are probably the easiest of all the sensors to calibrate. Right? And, and if calibrated radiance data is your, your key um, factor, then a line scanner is probably use this one. So let's start off with a line scan and take a look at how it works. All right, well, here's, here's sort of a diagram um, of a thermal infrared uh, line scan. And, and the reason this is uh, <coughs> depicted here is, is uh, I want to say, wow, well, as long as I've been with here, so since the middle of the 1980s, we've been flying infrared line scanners. Okay, we were, we were one of the um, few non government organizations that had one of these for a long time. And we had, we had a, a big unit built by Bendix, um, and it actually recorded on, let me check this out over here, recorded on analog tape, all right? So, um, you know, big, I want to say it was a 16-track professional audio tape recorder that we had a lot of around, so things about that big. Um, and eventually we, we made it digital. But, but this, is, this is essentially a schematic of that system. So let's take a look at, at, at what and how this sort of works. All right, you have some sort of recording media, now, now it'll be a digital recording system. Um, and what does that record? Well, it records a, a voltage out of a single detector, okay? So you have a single detector, in this case, it's located in a liquid nitrogen doer because the detector actually needs to be cooled down to liquid nitrogen temperatures to actually be able to detect thermal photons that are incident upon it. If it's not cooled down, it detects itself. And so it just essentially puts out noise. But if you cool it down uh, enough, you could um, actually detect you know, thermal photons that fall off the surface. Um, the best thermal detectors out there now are still cooled detectors. But there's a whole class of new thermal detectors that have come around probably in the past 20 years or so called uh, microbolometers um, that are room temperature. Right? But their signal noise ratio is a lot lower than you would see with a cool detector. All right, but the key is, that inside, right here at the at the bottom, you know, sitting at the bottom of this liquid nitrogen puddle, um, here is a single detector. Okay. And when I say that, I mean one element, one pixel. All right. So now, how do you image if you have just a single detector? Well, you got to take that detector, and somehow you got to manually move it all over your scene, sensing one pixel in the scene at a time. Okay. Um, the way that's done in an airborne sort of a system is as follows. You, you take that detector, and essentially, let's go backwards through the optical system here. So we take the detector, bounce it off a, a folding mirror just for uh, orientation. <coughs> go backwards through a telescope. Right? So here's a Cassegrainian telescope that we can go backwards through. And essentially, if you did that over here, you would project a very large image of that detector. 
Okay? If you were sitting at that point, you would see that. Well, what we're going to do is we're going to take one more fold mirror, and we're going to redirect that down to the ground. Right? So now you have an image of that detector on the ground. Well, that's not really how the system's going to work. Right? That section on the ground is going to come up, get reflected off the mirror, go through the telescope, eventually find its way to that detector. So we'll sample one point on the ground. All right, well, that doesn't form an image. All right, so the next thing that we wind up doing is rather than this just being a fixed fold mirror, it's actually a spinning scan mirror. All right, so we have a, um, you know, if you're, if you're up on the third floor sometime and you catch me, I could show you uh, our sensor, Missy, um, which we, uh, um, it, it, it does a lot of different wavelengths. It's actually a hyperspectral scanner, and we'll look at that in, in a minute. But it does have some, some uh, thermal infrared uh, detector and focal plane arrays on there. And I'll show you inside of there what the, it's a line scanner, by the way. And um, I'll show you inside what this, these optics actually look like, if, if you'd like. So this mirror is typically pretty large. In, in MISI, it's, it's about six inches um, in diameter. Right? So if you spin this mirror circularly, what will happen um, to your projected spot on the ground? Well, it's going to scan from, well, where is it going to scan from? It's going to scan 360 degrees all the way around, right? So there's going to be a portion of time that I'm pointing at the ground, and then there's a portion of the time that I'm going to be pointing up at the sky, and then back at the ground, and then down the sky. And I'm just going to take my detector and, and, and spin it around like this, essentially, spin its projected area around in a circle, and when it's hitting the ground, I can actually image, right? So I can go from horizon to horizon and get an image of what I see, okay? And that's probably not realistic because as you get very, very far out, you have lots of atmosphere in the way and you'd have a very hard time atmospherically correcting this data and it wouldn't be very useful. So typically what happens is there's just some portion of the bottom of this scanner, once we put a case around here that's open, right? And the actual casing itself serves as a field stop, so it would stop the scan at one end or the other. All right, but that mirror's still spinning around. So in the dead time, you actually have a very good advantage here. Um, you could, when you're looking up inside of the, the unit itself, you can put several, if you want to, calibrated black bodies or calibrated light sources inside of the, the cavity. So you can be looking at calibrated radiance sources on the back end of your scan, and then look at the ground. Look at calibrated radius sources, look at the ground. And do that in every single scan line. So essentially, on every single scan line, you can come up with a new calibration for that particular line. All right, so there's no other sensor systems out there that can do that sort of thing where every single line that, that, that you uh, gather can be calibrated independently. Okay? So if you have any sort of electronic drift in your detector um, system, if the gain changes, the bias changes, you know, you, you name it, there's all kind of things that can go on and, and cause electrical problems or, or, or sensing inconsistencies um, as, you, as you're running one of these scans. And if you can eliminate that, well then you, you should do that by all means. So, so calibration is awesome in these uh, systems. Now, how do you form an image out of this? Well, that's one single line on the ground. How do you get the next line on the ground? With your sensor. With your sensor, right? And if you're in an airplane, you better be moving your sensor forward <laughs> or you're gonna have problems, all right? So as you fly your aircraft forward, you collect the next line. And you fly it forward and you collect the next line. All right, so what, what sort of consideration do you need to do to, to form a good image there? Well, you've got to time how fast that mirror is spinning to your aircraft speed. Right? You want to time that as closely as possible. Um, there's lots of image processing techniques that you could do that if you have overlap between your lines, you could possibly increase the resolution of your sensor. There's all sorts of super resolution algorithms out there um, that you can do that with. But traditionally, you try and, and move ahead one line at a time, or one projected area at a time as, as you move across the scene. Uh, all right, so. Yeah. Is that clear for me, like in the in the ground ground swatch? Ground swatch, yes. Yeah. So it's the the mirror is spinning, right? 
yours? But, but still like the below place, it's the same place if, if the airplane is just standing, right? No, if the, air, if the airplane, let, let's say the airplane was stationary, yeah. as the mirror spins, you would, you would sense a, a line or a swath on the ground. And if the, and if the plane didn't move, it would sample that exact same spot again. Yeah. But if but the plane moves forward, you can sample the next swath forward. But it's, when it goes like all over this line, so it's like, uh, you're saying that it's one pixel, right? When, when, you, when you do the full scan from edge to edge, yeah. it's as many pixels as you want it to be. So I am deciding how many, exactly. how many records will be? Yes. So, so let, let me hold, hold that for one second, and maybe that'll become a little bit clearer here in a second. So let me, let me just introduce two, two terms, and I think this will help out. Um, H, you know, just as before in photogrammetry, was the flying height of the, the aircraft. Um, IFOV is what we usually refer to as the instantaneous field of view. Okay? That's normally the angular field of view of the detector as it's projected onto the ground. Right, so this is a very small number. This is, if you're looking through your optical system, this is the angle that you're looking at subtended by a single pixel. Right? When we say field of view, or just FOV, that normally represents the entire angular extent of one swath on the ground. Right? So in this picture, FOV goes from here to here. The instantaneous field of view is from here to here, where that is just the extent of a single pixel. Obviously, this looks a lot bigger, but this is a single pixel on the ground. So because we're typically very high, um, we can figure out the size of that pixel on the ground by multiplying it by the, um, the height of the sensor, the height of the aircraft. And that we normally call the GI FOV, or the ground instantaneous field of view. Or more typically, you'll hear that referred to as the spot size. Projected pixel on the ground. How big is a single pixel? That's always a question somebody asks you know, when you have a sensor. How big, how, what is the resolution? Well, how big is the pixel on the ground? And that's usually what folks refer to as the, the ground instantaneous field of view. Okay. This is usually expressed in units of distance, so meters, centimeters, um, as, is, as is the flying height. And IFOB is usually an angle. Well, it's always an angle. All right, so this pixel size in the across track um, direction, so going from side to side, is a GIFOV. You usually want to you spin your mirror at a rate so that you advance one GIFOV on the ground before you scan past that exact point again. So one of the things that you need to, uh, to be aware of with these also is that since you're flying, let's say here's our direction of flight. So let's go up the page here. As I spin the mirror and the plane is moving forward, the scan on the ground is going to be at an angle. If I start on this side and I end my collection of that particular swath on this side, my pixels you know, move across the page in a, in a line. So now I want to make sure I move far enough forward so that when I get to my next swath, which will be parallel, hopefully, to the last swath, that these pixels touch one another. And every one of them touch each other as you go across. So your image will be slightly skewed if you do no post-processing on, on the data. Now we'll do lots of post-processing on the data afterwards the end point. That make sense? Because the airplane is not stationary? What's that? Because the airplane is not stationary? Yeah, you have to, you have to move it forward. Or else you just get one big pixel just keeps getting bigger and bigger, or smaller and smaller. <laughs> you could, uh, oh, you can get it closer. All right. Carl, they don't have overlap between the two <coughs> lines? Over overlap in what sense? Like, they don't want to overlap the pixels. They want to move oh, to well, each other? you know, there's all kind of, all kind of um, thoughts on that. Sometimes people would like to overlap the pixels like this. You get a little bit of overlap for two reasons. To make sure you don't miss anything, and you can do some image processing after the fact to use the fact that you collected 
data here twice to improve the resolution. Okay. Mostly it's so you don't miss anything. So people will usually spin the mirror a little faster or fly a little slower so that you do have some overlap um, between adjacent rows just so you don't happen to move that far forward. Now you have a pixel here or let's say over here and over here and, and you never sample this area. But as you see, that's going to be the least of our problems for the landscape. Okay, so unfortunately, planes aren't the most stable imaging platforms in the world. Okay. So a plane will roll side to side. Okay. A plane will pitch up or down, depending on how fast you're flying. And a, a, a plane will, will yaw or crab to usually fly into the wind right, to, to maintain its stability and still maintain a forward vector. Okay, So pitch, you normally don't pitch this way. I'm not a pilot, but I think you normally don't pitch down, right? I think you normally pitch up. I don't know. Depends on your nose. I would think you'd start going down real quickly here. Um, so normally you, you pitch in an upward direction, but normally that's pretty stable. A good pilot will keep a plane you know, at the same pitch angle you know, all throughout the flight line. So that's, that's normally pretty stable. So what does that mean? Well, it means the, the, uh, the imaging sensor projected area on the ground is going to be slight, forward, slight in the forward direction of the flight or, or slightly behind, depending on which way you pitch. Yaw, um, a pilot normally will hold that pretty well. Right, as, you're, as you're flying um, into a, a headwind. And what's that going to do? Well, it's just going to change the direction of your scan line on the ground. Right? So those two things are pretty stable. But one thing pilots aren't great at, and I'm not saying that's a bad thing or a good thing, right? but, but the plane is going to roll back and forth. Right? Well, what, that, what is that going to do? Well, it's going to change where that swap occurs in the across-track direction on the ground. And that can happen at a fairly high frequency. Right? So you might collect a couple between your plane being pitched um, slightly this way to be, I'm oh, sorry, rolling slightly this way to slightly this way. That could be a couple of scan lines and that could occur. So you can get some very strange distortions in your imagery because of that. All right, so, so keep that in mind for a second. Um, so what does that look like? All right, so here's, here's roll. Right, now, it might not be very easy to see because of the contrast here. But let, me, uh, let me try and zoom in a little bit. Let's just take a look at this image on the left hand side here. All right, so let's see your photo interpretation skills. What do you think this is? Okay, now typically the asphalt on the side of a parking lot is pretty straight. Everybody agree to that? You got to look between, the, you know, where the asphalt met the grass. Normally, a pretty straight line. Well, look at that line where the asphalt meets the grass. Okay, it's 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 extremely wavy. Right? Why is that? Well, that's because as the plane was flying in this direction, the plane was rolling side to side. So some scan lines got shifted out to the left. Some scan lines got shifted out to the right. So you get this, this distortion. But if you look across the line, it's pretty consistent. Right? You can see the same sorts of patterns happening in these, these linear features. All right, well, that's pretty easy to, to, to keep track of. If you have it on, on board your aircraft, if you have a gyro, you can record the attitude of the, the aircraft itself. So on your sensor, you typically attach a, a gyro that records the roll, the pitch, and the yaw. You can record all three of those things using accelerometers and gyroscopes. Um, we're building a, a balloon-based camera right now, and, and we have a digital accelerometer gyroscope magnetometer. It right? does all, all nine um, measurements for us. And it's amazing. This thing cost us $1.98. I was like, that's, that's just amazing. You could buy a little digital circuit that does all that for, for buck 98. Um, so once you record that, what you can do after the fact is you can shift your lines. So 
you can take each line that you collected and shift it to the left or to the right, depending on how far the aircraft was rolled. So if I move over to the right-hand side here, you can see that now the edge of that parking lot is nice and straight. But you see the waviness on the edge of the image. Well, why is that? Well, it's because the scan line stopped there. So I don't have any data past this point. Right? And you get the equivalent on the other side. Uh, the image you can see is sort of a mirror over here of what you have over here. But now the image is now rectilinear again. Everything that, that was square is square. Yeah. Can't we put all the sensor uh, outside, like you know, below the, the airplane? And the airplane will do like that, but this will still stay Absolutely. stable. Yeah. So so another another solution to this is the gyro stabilize the sensor itself. Right? So you don't even have to hang it outside. There's there's gimbals that you can mount inside the aircraft um, that will keep the, the sensor stable perfectly flat and that the aircraft could be rolling all around it. Absolutely. It's very expensive. Right, to put a, put a gyro stabilized mount on a sensor, it's still a very expensive thing to do. Right, so, so typically folks hard mount these sensors to the aircraft and correct it afterwards as opposed to doing it in the aircraft just, just because of cost. But that is certainly the way you want to do it. If you, if you have the budget to, to put a gyro stabilized um, mount on your sensor, absolutely. I have one question. Yeah. So here in this image, you don't really see like the thickness of the image due to the fly. I mean, does it seems like every line is actually pretty horizontal. Yeah. Is that just because of the speed? That it's the speed, you, and, and it's all the quality of the pilot, mm -hmm. right? I mean, there are pilots who can keep on a heading. We the one pilot that flies our wasp sensor for us um, is a company called Kachera out of. Um, uh, uh, the, town near Cleveland, Ohio. Um, they could, they can fly, if I plot their flight lines on a, on a GIS map, those things are perfectly straight. And their speeds stay constant like you would do. Um, those are the people who you want to find your aerial imagery. It also depends on wind conditions. Absolutely. Um, so if you have like a sudden wind burst that, that come up out of nowhere. Yeah. So, so line scanners are, are kind of a good and a bad, right? You can calibrate these things fantastically because you have a single detector, right? And the, and the ability to calibrate a single detector, or the, the, you know, to calibrate a single detector, very easy thing to do. And you can calibrate it on every line, right? I don't know if you noticed here, you see that it's black on this side of the scan line, and it's, it's, it's brighter on this side of the scan line, right? That's not an image processing artifact, that is, Inside the cavity, this is a cold black body, and this is a warm black body. So at the beginning and the end of every scan line, I hit a black body. And so I have calibration data from here to here. And so for this line of data, I measure this point, I measure this point, come up with a calibration curve, and I have absolute radiance. Okay. So that's 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 roll, and that's one of the one of the bigger problems that you see with. Now there's there's more, all right. So if you're if you're not flying, um, fast enough to be in perfectly synced with your mirror. So in other words, just like just like you were saying earlier, Maria, if you have a if you have an overlap between pixels or you don't have an overlap between pixels, you can have a lot of overlap if you fly too slow, or if you spin your mirror too fast. Okay, you get gaps if you fly too fast. Or spin your mirror too slow. I mean, but typically you, you never do the latter, um, but oftentimes you do the, the, the first one because you want that overlap. But what's going to happen? Well, if you fly forward and you multiply scan lines, you're going to get um, a distortion that's called V over H. Right? That's normally what they refer to. And it has to do with the velocity of the aircraft, that's the V, and the height of the aircraft. If you're, if you have a lot of overlap happening, you could compress your image in the forward flying direction. Okay. So everything looks like it's sort of squashed in the vertical direction. That's okay, right? Because we know the size of the pixel. And we know the size of our detector. We know our flying height. We know our optical system. So we know the size of the pixel uh, and what it should be on the ground. We might know it's square or rectangular in size, depending on what kind of a detector you have. 
So we can resample this image afterwards in the processing and stretch it in the, the vertical direction. And then get, look the right size again. And then go ahead and do the roll correction again. Um, usually you do the roll correction first and then do the, the stretching in the, in the vertical direction. All right, so that can be corrected um, after the fact. As long as you, you know your flying speed and you know your height. So in order to know those things, in addition to an accelerometer and a gyroscope, um, typically on your aircraft, you'd like to have a GPS. Right? So if you have a, a, a GPS on board, you know your velocity at every point. You compute that for every scan line, and then you could differentially even scale this image if your velocity happened to be changing as you were flying through the scene. All post processing, absolutely. Yeah, what gets recorded out to your your, your device, um, you know, during flight is just the scan line data. It's a, I'm having a hard time understanding how um, how that works there. So it isn't if you were scanning the same portion of the previous line. You're gonna be stretched. Yeah. Yes, I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. You're right. I, I see what you're saying. Um, if you're if you're if you're multiply scanning the same line, your image is going to appear as if it's stretched, and you're going to have to compress it. If you're scanning, all right. So that's the same as scanning too fast. Mm -hmm. Yes. If you're scanning too slow, you'll be compressed. You're absolutely right. Now, here's another problem. And after this, you're going to say, why does anybody ever fly a line scanner? <laughs> OK? Um, if I have a detector sitting in my, in my sensor itself, and I am going through a series of fold mirrors and projecting it onto the ground, if I project that detector directly below the aircraft, straight down, or project it 45 degrees out to the side, what's going to change about my projected area in that detector? Yeah, OK. It's going to vary. It's going to vary at every single point along that scan. Right? That projected area on the ground is going to get larger as I move further out away from the true mater position. Okay. So that's called tangent error. Easy to take care of because back in the um, sensor itself, let me go back to the picture you had here. Um, usually on the back side of this rotating mirror, we normally have a plate that has a, uh, usually just a, a, you know, an LED and a slight hole in the plate. And we can, we can know exactly when this thing hits the dead up position, right? So every time this thing spins around, we can know exactly where this thing is. So we, we know how fast this mirror is spinning. And if we know how fast this mirror is spinning, we can know the angle that that mirror is pointing at at any time during the scan line. And if we know the angle that it's pointing at, and we know the roll of the aircraft, and you have to know both of those things, then you can predict how, where on the ground that pixel fell, how far away from Nader, and if you know the angle, you use the tangent of that angle to resize that pixel. Okay? All right, so that works in the across track direction. But the pixel is also going to grow fore and after the aircraft, right? It's, it's also going to get bigger this way and this way, not only side to side. Nothing you're going to do about that one. All right, so what's going to happen there? As you get further out to the sides, you're going to sample the next line and the previous line, right? Your pixel is going to include areas that were in the next line and the previous line, right? So unfortunately, you're going to get a, a blur that starts to occur as you move further and further off later. And so you'll get a differential blur as a function of, of position. Now, there's probably some really cool defocusing, deconvolution kernel based on column in the image that you can apply to this. Um, but it's blurred data to begin with. So I mean, you're never going to reconstruct it exactly. All right, so, so tangent error in the across track direction is correctable. Tangent error in the long track direction is that's typically why these things don't go to horizon to horizon. 
you, you normally restrict them maybe to plus or minus 60 degrees, so about 120 degrees is about what you, you, you know, the typical line scan is. Yeah. And in that, in that sort of a situation, if you're at plus or minus 60, how big does your pixel throw? Cosine, <laughs> right? You figure out the cosine, so you're still pretty small though. Right? You go beyond that, then it starts to get big pretty quickly. All right, so that's that's the tangent here. All right. Um, now, you'd also like to place every pixel on the ground at exactly where it's supposed to be. With this sort of a system, you can see that if you sampled at you know some regular angular interval, the position of those pixels on the ground is going to move. Okay. If I want to map where these pixels fall, so I want to have you know cartographic accuracy, then I need to be able to to put those back where they were. So if I have roll pitching yaw from a gyroscope or an, uh, an INS, which is an uh, uh, internal. Navigation system, they just like, what's the eye? <laughs> Internal navigation system. Um, and a GPS, so you know where you are. Um, if you have those those uh, angles, then you can go ahead and place each pixel. All right, except that the world's not usually flat. Right? The world usually is uh, has some sort of topography associated with it. So you also need to know how high the ground is where that pixel got projected to do good orthographic sorts of projections where these pixels will fall back on the ground. Now, if you want to learn all that mathematics on how to do that stuff, um, next quarter, Photogrammetry 1, Don Light's class, he will go through how to, how to do all that sort of uh, placing and cartographic uh, sorts of accuracies for data just like this. So if you want to do that kind of stuff, that would that'd be a great class to follow along with. Great question. Inertial. Yeah, it's inertial. It's inertial. 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 Yeah. Thank you. All right. So, all right. So that's a single detection. Now, it's easy to take these systems and make them such that they can um, record multiple channels of data, or multiple band paths. So what, what I just showed you was a thermal infrared sensor. So we, we just had the detector up to this point, right, where we're collecting on, on the detector that was being cooled right here. Well, imagine, rather than putting a fold mirror here, we put a beam switch, right? So we took half the, half the energy and put it up towards the thermal detector, and we took the other half of the energy and, and sent it down this way through another optical system. All right, so I have, I'm at, I'm at my uh, focal point here. I can recollimate my light. And then I can bring it back to focus over here. And what does that allow me to do? Well, at this point, I can place another detector right here. Right? So I could have a, one detector here, one detector here, and now simultaneously I, can, can, I could um, record two channels of data. And those could be two different wavelengths. Right? This could be a filter. I could put, a, let's say, a red filter in here. So I only got red photons focused on to this detector. Right? That would be that would be great. Now I'd have infrared data or thermal infrared data, and I'd have red data. Right? So I have two bands. Okay? Well, I can get even trickier. I could, at this point, pass through um, either a diffraction grating or a prism, and I could disperse my light based on wavelength. And if I do that, I could put a series of detectors along the the uh, dispersion direction, and I can sample the blue, the green, the red, the near infrared, and so on, as I move further and further out in the dispersed direction. Now all of a sudden, what do I have? Well, I have a sensor that collects multiple bands, right, usually referred to as a multispectral sensor. And the advantage is that because right here at the beginning of my optical train inside of the sensor, um, I have an aperture stop, right? The only, only energy that's getting into the system is what comes through this field stop, this aperture. Okay? That is a single pixel on the ground. That's all the energy that's coming in. 
So no matter what I do, if I detect it this location or disperse it and collect at all these the, um, locations or, or with all these detectors, I am measuring exactly the same spot on the ground in all these wavelength regions, right? So I have an inherent registration between spectral channels using this kind of a system. That may sound pretty mundane or, or, or something that you would always want, but it's something that you don't get all the time. Um, even in your cameras that you have in your phones or your, your, your uh, standalone cameras, they use a, a discreetly sampled array. So at any particular pixel location, you only measure one color, red, green, or blue. And everything else is interpreted. Um, here, you get red, green, and blue. Let's say we only have three detectors. If you get it at every location of the scene. And it's calibrated. Right? So you have calibrated, inter, you know, exactly registered data for every pixel for all your spectral maps, no matter how, how many you have. And you know, you could put a linear array here. So let's say you had a 256 element linear array. And you, and you put that linear array at this location. You get 256 spectral maps because you're measuring along the dispersed direction of the white light. You can even go further out. Let's say these were silicon detectors. You can go out and put a, a gallium arsenide detector or a or gallium arsenide detector array out here, and then you can even go further. So it's very easy to put together a system like this where you collect from 0.4 out to two, um, out to two and a half microns. So 400 nanometers out to 2,500 nanometers. Easy to come up with a dispersive system that you can do that. So with the diffraction grading, you have a loss of energy further off the air. Yes. Is that the same with the beam splitter? Well, I mean, the beam splitter passes everything. So so you will get a loss. You send half of the light one way and half of the light the other. Okay. You could, I think you could design beam splitters so you could send 25% one way and 75% the other way, and you know, any combination that you wanted to. But you don't worry about like the first, the closest detector to it getting more accurate data than the furthest? Oh, yeah, you absolutely worry about that. Okay. So normally what you do is you put your hottest detectors further away and your, your detectors with the lowest signal noise closer. You know, pass the most energy to the detectors that have the least signal noise ratio. So that's not like a constant, this detector always has the highest signal noise, right? You mean internal? Well, usually silicon arrays are pretty pretty sensitive, signal noise ratio is pretty high. So your, your visible portion of the spectrum is usually going to be where the fewest photons go, as opposed to the thermal and red ones usually require the most um, energy on them to, to get a good signal noise ratio, especially with microvolumeters and you know, electrical detectors. So, so yes, it's not, OK, what do you, what do you mean by constant? I mean, there's. I mean, like it depends on what you're looking at, right? So there are times when your yeah. thermal is going to be different yeah. than visible. Yeah. Yeah. So so, let's say you're looking. Uh, you have an infrared, uh, a near infrared sensor, so something at about one micron. If you're looking at vegetation, you have lots of photons coming from vegetation. If you're looking at water, you have almost no photons. Mm -hmm. So yes, you need to design your sensor in such a way that you put the detectors with the right signal noise ratio in the right places so that you collect what you're interested in collecting. But the minute you design your sensor to be a vegetation sensor, you're going to fly it over water because you only have one sensor. Right? So it, it's, that, is, that is a design trade-off you absolutely have to make. I see, I see exactly what you're saying. It depends, it's target dependent. And you're, all, you're never going to make the right decision for all targets. Yeah. That's a very good point. All right. So there are a lot of um, you know things you could do on the back end. This is that little plate that I was referring to on the back end of the, the scan mirror. Um, it could be a plate, you know, solid plate with some notches in there. You can have a, a sink detector, so a little LED light source over here, a little detector on here, it tells you when you're you know dead center. Um, tells you when the start of the scan line is, end of your scan line is. Um, you can have calibration pulses so you know that you're, you're looking at your 
calibration sources at that particular time. You can do all sorts of things to have an auxiliary signal that goes along with your image data. Right? So this, this is your scan. Right? So, so you started your scan line, you're looking at the ground. Right? This is your, your voltages as you're looking at the ground. Then you hit the end of the line. Then you look at your calibration source, one of the black bodies. Let's say the hot one. Then you look at the cold black body over here. And then you start the next line. And, and this pulse, which is either going to be on or off, you can use that to then look at the voltages that are being recorded as a function of time and place everything in the right place. You know, this is negative 120 degrees, pos oh, I'm sorry, negative 60 degrees, positive 60 degrees in your scan line, it's zero straight down, and, and even though when you're at zero. Right? So, you, so you, can, you can have all sorts of intuitive electronics on the back end to, to help you condition this data. Because right? it's a mess when you get it down. All you have is this long series of voltages, now you've got to make an image of it. Having these, these calibration pulses in there is very dumb. All right. Is, is that the usual sensor that you have, where you have Apple encoders or relative encoders? Oh, or yeah, or well. Because it's a very uh, customized encoder, right? This one? Yeah. Absolutely. Um, yes, there's all kinds of visual encoders that you can put on there. Mm -hmm. But this is an LED and a detector, as opposed to a digital encoder, which are, are quite expensive, again. Mm -hmm. um, this is very hard to make fail, right? I mean, this is a hole, put light through a hole, right? right? Um, visual encoders fail, right? So, so you got to think about cost, first of all, right? There's a lower cost solution. And it's actually a more robust solution um, in the sense that you could, you could expose this to all kind of electromagnetic radiation. You could do whatever you want. And it's going to be very hard to, to make this system fail. So when you're designing it, you know, it's not always, you shouldn't always go for that, you know, hey, you know, I can go buy this great digital encoder. Um, just because it's, it's great, it'll give you exactly the, the data that you need, but then you gotta think, is that gonna last 10 years, 20 years? How long do I want this sensor to live? Um, what's my budget? Okay. So, so we did, when we built our sensor, we built it essentially on just, you know, money that we had laying around in the lab. <laughs> it wasn't a lot. So, so, and we built it over the course of probably 10 years, you know, just scraping things together. Um, actually started as a class project uh, at, at, a, at a remote class once. Um, we said, hey, let's design a sensor this quarter. The class came up with a great design, and we started building it right after the, the class. Um, so, so you got you to weigh a lot of things when you're, when you're putting it together for design. You know, from how you're going to use it, like we're just referring to the uh, civil noise ratio, to how much you want to spend on each of the components. If this works just as good as a digital encoder, put more money into your detector. Right? Get better All right, now, this, uh, uh, this sort of a system, again, let me just go back to the picture for a sec. Uh, this mirror, think about it, I said it was about six inches in diameter. It's about this long. And it's made out of aluminum. No, we made one out of aluminum. And what happens when you start spinning an aluminum, aluminum sphere at very, very high speeds? I'm talking 1,000 RPMs or 1,500, 2,000 RPMs, those sorts of speeds. Aluminum's a fairly soft metal. What happens as you start to spin a soft metal? It starts to deform a little bit, right? The last thing you want is your optically flat mirror to deform, right? So normally you want to make this out of a, a, a you know, very strong material. Um, I forget what we actually used uh, in our design. But when it came back, it would be on a table, and I would go over and lift it, and it would be like, oh, that's pretty heavy. So we put this thing on a, on a spin motor, and started the thing spinning, got up to about 1,000 RPMs, and the table that the motor was mounted to started to boom, 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 pop and it actually started moving across the room, right? So I mean, it was so, there was so much mass, so much inertia behind this mirror that it, it was actually able to take a, uh, a table, a fairly heavy lab table, across a room. Um, so then you hollow it out on the inside, right? Make it a little lighter, and now you made it a little weaker, right? So it started to deform again. We went through several of these mirrors before you finally come up with the right design. So having a spinning mirror inside of an aircraft is, is um, 
maybe not something you always want to do, especially if the aircraft is something like a UAV. Right? A UAV is fairly light. Right? You start getting a big inertial source like that inside of a UAV, you can start adjusting the attitude of the UAV itself if it's fixed to it. Okay? So while this design is great for a large aircraft or a satellite, um, small aircraft, it, it gets a, a little squirrely. Another design um, to do the same sort of a thing is what the, the GOES satellite uses. This is a, the, um, what is GOES? <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Right. Good, good <laughs> this is where we get our, our weather data from. No matter our work on GOES, I still have a hard time saying you said that. All right, so, so what GOES um, is, it's in a, ge in a geosynchronous orbit. So it stays you know, at the same place on the Earth all the time. And, and it scans out the Earth twice a day, I believe. I think, it's, I, think it's a, I think you get a full image of the Earth twice a day. I don't know if that's written on on one. On one, yeah. Yeah, there's many, many close out. Right, but the way it, the, there's no scan mirror in here. It's a scanner, it's a line scanner. Um, it has a single detector, it has a telescope, it has a fold mirror, right? But the way it spins its fold mirror is pretty unique. It spins the whole satellite. So the satellite just sits there and rotates, right? Because that satellite's rotating, it's rotating the scan mirror, and it scans out across the Earth. You can tilt that mirror so you can scan different equatorial lines across the Earth's surface. Okay, so you can start at the North Pole, go down to the South Pole, and come back up. Okay? And all the spinning is just the satellite itself. Okay? That helps with a lot of things. That keeps the satellite very stable. Because right? that satellite is spinning, it doesn't move very much. So you have very good pointing accuracy. How do you spin a satellite? You just need tons of fuel? I have no clue. Um, I would. It takes fuel to like correct it within its orbit, right? You can correct with fuel in its orbit. Um, I don't know. I mean, if you're in geosynchronous orbit, you're really high. You have. I mean, once you start spinning something in space, it doesn't it's stop. Easy. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know if it needs to, to have a propulsion to it, or it just naturally stays spinning. Yeah. Yeah, but I don't know if it uses those for this because if you if you put a thruster on, you would change the speed. No, exactly. Right? So I think like once it gets there, like maybe they like small yeah, corrections, small corrections to make sure that yeah. it's, it's safe. It's I'd have to I'd have to look into how it's kept in, in that rotation. All right. Now, so so everything about a line scanner sounded uh, like there was really good things, really bad. But let me, let me ask you about one thing. How long does the detector look at one point on the ground? Relative. Very short or very long time? Very short, right? You're spinning that mirror and you're moving it all the time. So it only looks at one point on the ground a very short period of time. That means the amount of time you have to dwell and collect photons from that point on the ground is very short. Right? So your signal to noise um, ratio is going to be fairly low. Your detector's normally bigger, your detector's normally better, so that sort of compensates for the dwell time. Right? If you need to buy just a single detector, you can spend a lot of money and, and get a, a one that will do a good job for you. All right, now, to, to help with this, you can do a lot of things. There's, so there's a lot of modifications you can do to scanners. If rather than a single detector, we put a linear array of detectors and scan a linear array of detectors across the ground, Rather than one, you can collect several lines at the same time. Right? So for instance, here, if we had, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, six uh, elements in a linear array, one scan of the mirror can scan six lines on the ground. Okay? What does that let you do? You can stand longer for what reason? You, well, yeah, you definitely want to stand longer to increase your signal noise ratio. You have less air too. You have you have you have less air side to side because you have one scan, one one roll to correct from those six lines. And you can spin the mirror slower or faster. Slower. Slower, because you're scanning out six lines, and you've got to wait for your vehicle to move forward six GIFODs 
rather than one. Or you can speed the, uh, or you can speed up the airplane. Speed up what? The airplane. You, you can speed up the airplane, absolutely. Right? So you have a lot of advantages if you can do multiple detectors. All right, um, so if we, if we were to do that, uh, this is this is designed for what's um, called the Landsat uh, multispectral scanner. Um, it was a four-band system, so it's like in four different spectral bands. So at the focal plane, you you, you had a dispersive element, which isn't shown here, and you were able to scan six lines at a time and collect four bands because you had four of these uh, detector arrays. So 24 detectors total um, that you could scan across. And it was an oscillating mirror rather than a spinning mirror. So this mirror went boom, boom, back and forth. Okay, like this, rather than spinning all the way around. Just oscillated back side to side. All right. That kind of a, a scanner is called a whisk room. Okay, because you ever had a whisk room? Right? Those little rooms that you use with the dust pans, right? You kind of swept out several lines on the ground at a time. And the way that you did it with the MSS, the, the multispectral uh, scanner, was the scan direction was always in one direction, going from left to right. So it would sweep left to right, then it would wait for it to advance, the, the, the vehicle to advance, then it would, it would go back to the left-hand side and sweep left to right again. Advance, go back to the left-hand side, sweep left to right again. So what that did was it gave you parallel lines on the ground, provided you had no uh, roll in your sensor. And this was a satellite-based system, so you know, the roll was very minimal. Um, so you would sweep out six lines, sweep out the next six lines, sweep out the next six lines, but you would always do it in the left to right position. So that was a, that's a t traditional whisk room uh, design. Does that make sense? Yeah. The area of uh, each pixel will become to be very different between the first one and the last one, right? Because you have six lines. We have, you, have, you have six lines that are parallel. So at any one time, the pixel projections on the ground are equal. But you have the same sort of tangential errors that you have with the line scanner. Is that, is that what you mean? Because like the area of the, of the detector of the, or the airplane, is the, uh, the size of the airplane, the detector will stay the same, right? The mirror stay, the size of the mirror stay the same. Yes. Uh, so now you're covering a lot more of area on the surface. In the in the so forward scan direction, you're covering more area. So the area of each pixel is not changing? No. We need to well, well it changes lines. the function of angle. Not of it, between the lines? No, no, at, at any particular point. So if we're sampling here, 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 and here. So right at that point, all the detectors will be the same size. And as you move further out, they'll grow. The projected areas will grow and start to overlap one another. But they'll always be the same size at each location. This is, again, this is, this is very small. I mean, it, yes, if, 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 you were, you know, if you were projecting a very large area on the ground, then going through the optical system, you would have some sort of growing distortion. But in a system like this, typically you oversize your optics. I see, where you, I see where you're going. Typically, you oversize your optics and use the sweet spot of that optics right in the center. Right? So, so your mirrors are bigger than they need to be, and you only use the area in the center of the mirror. Absolutely. All right. So that's the, the multi-structure scanner, Landsat MSS. That was on Landsats 1, 2, 3, and 4, um, I believe. So, so the last, last MSS sensor probably went uh, well, was launched in 1983 or 84 or so. Right, so, so those that those have been uh, been up there for a while. Um, so, on the Landsat series of sensors, the MSS, uh, if you look at it, that was on one, two, and three. So that was on Landsat one, two, and three, four, and five. Oh, there was Lance on Landsat five. There was an MSS also. Um, the pixels on the ground, just to give you some stats for these kind of things, are about 80 meters. Right, so these are big pixels. Um, and they covered the green, the red, the near infrared, and a little further out in the near infrared. So about 0.5 uh, to about 1.1 microns was what the band has to cover. And uh, you know th those were great for vegetation studies. Right? These were these were perfect bands chosen to, to look at vegetation on the ground. Now starting with Landsat 4, 
Um, they put a new sensor on there called the thematic mapper, right, or Landsat TM, and Landsat 4, Landsat 5, and Landsat 7 all had a, a version of the thematic mapper on them. Uh, Landsat uh, 7 did not have an MSS uh, scanner that went up on it. Uh, the thematic mapper had a little better resolution, about 30 meters underground. It also had a thermal channel, um, so Landsat band 6, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 7 were in the reflective region. 6 was the thermal channel. And um, that was about 120 meters, where the reflective ones were about 30 meters. So, so much better resolution than the, the multispectral scanner had. Uh, but the neat part about the MSS was its design. Or, I'm sorry, about the thematic mapper was its, its optical design. It was also a visc room, but in order to collect and let you stay on the ground longer at any particular spot, so to increase the dwell time even more, Rather than this single direction scan that the MSS did, where you had a scan, move back, allow the vehicle to move forward, and then scan again, the Matic Mapper scanned in both directions. So it scanned as you were going to left to right, and then right to left, and left to right, and, left, and right to left. All right, now, that causes some very strange um, pixel collection geometry, right? Because as you're flying forward, As you're flying forward, and you scan left to right, you look like this on the ground. So if this is my flight direction, I scan like this. Well, then if I scan back, I go like this, and I go like this, right? So if I scan multiple lines with multiple detectors, I scan like that, and then each, well, I draw this very nicely, but you can imagine, you get lots of lines that are overlapping in different locations here, and then they do the same thing as they go across this way. And so that sort of a, a pattern on the ground um, is a nightmare to kind of deconstruct. Right? So, when it's gonna be hard to do post-processing, what's a smart thing to do? When the software guys say that's gonna be way too hard to do, who do they yell at? They yell at the hardware guys. They fix this in hardware, I don't wanna deal with it afterwards. So that's what they came up with with the, the, the thematic map. It was a great correction for that. So you had that same oscillating mirror. So it was racking back and forth. Right? Went through the telescope, came and hit what was called a scanline corrector, which was a series of two mirrors. All right? So another fold mirror and another fold mirror. And those two mirrors rotated around this axis. So you can see the axis of rotation here. So what would occur is that as this one swept across the scene, this one would straighten the lines out, all right, or the projected area of the lines on the ground. So if I go back to my picture, it would cause this sweep to occur. It would change this sweep right here to this sweep just by changing the, the orientation with the mirror. And then as it scanned back, it would rotate back the other way. All right, so that little simple change in your optical system made a whole lot, made it a whole lot easier to correct the data afterwards because you didn't have to. And the other nice part was you never resampled the same points on the ground again. Okay, so you got rid of this double sampling of, of areas on the ground, which you know, this was a this smart thing to do in hardware. Um, then you would, you would come through the primary focal plane, so bands one through four, these were the visible silicon-based bands. Um, actually, they were, I think they're photomultiplier tubes on Landsat uh, 5, and they're, they're uh, CCDs now. But at, at this point was bands one through four. You went through another set of relay optics and went back and recorded bands five through seven on another focal plane. So you actually had multiple focal planes that you were recording on for this particular design, just, just because of, of where they didn't lay out the hardware. All right, now, if you imagine this sort of a system, think about this, this is a mirror going whack, 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 back and forth, right? And this is another mirror going boom, 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 back and forth. Is that a really robust hardware design? That's gonna break, right? I mean, if, you're, if you have something racking back and forth, hitting field stops, it's gonna break. Well, the remarkable thing was, 1984 this was launched, and it just failed last year, or a year before. So that was, Almost 30 years, right? 
20, 25, 26 years that this thing worked in orbit. It was designed to work. I think the original design spec was for three years. And, and it lasted you know, almost nine times that length. Um, so now, the data we get down off the Landsat 5 actually looks like this, unfortunately. So we get big gaps on the ground. We have multiple covered spots. Um, but there is some data in here, like the data right in here, where there's no overlap, and the data right here where there's no overlap. That's still useful data, but we have some you know, holidays or missing spots on the ground that, that we can't see. Uh, and I, if anybody knows um, Nima, uh, who hopefully is graduating very soon, um, he had to deal with this uh, problem with the data. And actually, I had to come up with some corrections for that. So if you want to talk to somebody about some woes and, and work with that data, he, he has some tools to, to deal with it. All right, so that's what we just talked about. Um, the actual detectors on, on these uh, focal planes are actually laid out in, a, in, a, in sort of a strange way. Um, each of these lines that you see here is a band, all right? And each of these little areas that you see right here is a linear array of detectors, all right? So rather than to, to come up with a large linear array of detectors, rather than coming up with a very expensive single linear array, you can come up with some lower cost, smaller linear arrays, and stagger them next to one another. Right? Ideally, you'd want to put them in a line. Right? But if you put them in a line, what happens is when you have a, a linear detector, right, you usually have a board of some sort, and then there's detector material in the middle. Right? So if I wanted to put two of these next to each other, put one over here, I have a gap right here where I can't collect data. So rather than doing it and button them against each other, you could put the other one, let's see, let's start it over here, and the detector material can come here. And now if you're flying in the or scanning with the whisper in the forward direction, you always have coverage at this point. You won't have any gaps. Okay. But these project to different areas on the ground now. It doesn't do a line on the ground. But you know your focal plane. You know how it's laid out. You know the dimensions. You know your optics. So you can, post-processing, take these pixels and mate them up with the pixels from the next line and get everything to fall in the right place. It takes a little post-processing to do. Um, but it does let you get complete coverage. And it lets you use lower-cost detectors. Right, so this, this staggered array concept is something you'll see in all kinds of sensor designs. Um, it makes for a little headache in data handling, but lets you really keep your costs down um, when it comes to making your detector or your sensor. So, you know, when it's all said and done, it does make images. Right? That's the Landsat Mapper image of Lake Ontario. Ontario. It's written up there. <laughs> right, so this is Lake Ontario. Um, Rochester is. Uh, we are we are about here. That's um, I want to click that. Why were the why were the boxes in the areas bigger on the cool side? Why are the boxes here bigger than the boxes here? Mm -hmm. Why do you have to make a bigger detector? Less sensitive. Less sensitive detector. Okay. Right. So the, you you need more detector area when the detector material is less sensitive. So these are the um, Mercury cadmium telluride thermal infrared sensors, and these are the, let's see, these are probably, uh, I'm not sure of the detector material here, but they're probably some sort of dope gallium arsenide detector, and these are silicon-based detectors. And because of the sensitivity, the size of the detector needs to grow, and if the size of the detector grows, what happens to the GIFOB? It gets larger, right? So that's why the thermal pixels are, pixels are always bigger than the visible pixels. Is it related to the primary? Why are they cooled though? Oh, why are they cooled? Mm -hmm. um, because the material itself is, is um, well, it's so sensitive. Wow. What, what, what's a good way of saying it? If you don't cool the detector, the detector is at a temperature where it starts producing photons that it detects. If that makes sense. <laughs> right? So the material itself um, is at a temperature above absolute zero. So it emits photons, and then the detector material re-detects those photons that it's emitting. So you have to cool the detector material so the number of photons that get emitted are low, 
and then the energy coming from the ground through your optical system overpowers the amount of energy coming from the detector material itself. And you just don't waste your time cooling. <coughs> you could cool silicon, but it's it's so you know it's so sensitive a material to begin with that you don't have to worry about it. It's just because the, the sensitivity of these detectors is so low that you need to cool them to make them work. You could replace these with microbolometers, but you will get a signal noise problem, and you get all kinds of electronic drift in a microbolometer also. I have a, I have a microbolometer camera upstairs. I mean, it's literally an inch and a half by an inch and a half by an inch and a half with a lens on the front of it. Right? And I, I plug a USB cable into it, plug it into my computer, and I get thermal images. It's uncool, um, but if I, if I stare at an object, and I know that object's not changing temperature, and I watch the image, you can, you can actually see the digital counts changing because it's just not stable. They're great for play with, right? And they're great. And these are the kind of detectors that, um, when they sell a thermal imager to, let's say, an electrical contractor, you know, that would go into your house and look at your breaker box to see, hey, that you got a hot circuit over there. Um, there, you just need to see that's hotter than this. We can't do reading. I should, should give you a break, but nobody was screaming for a break. <laughs> let's, let's go a couple more minutes. I think Monica is going to show up around 11.30 uh, to go in the lab. So let, me just, let me just start on push rooms here. All right, so that's, that's line scanners or, or, or whisk room scanners. But, but some sort of a <coughs> scanning operation has to occur to actually move the detectors over the scene. Now, as I referred to in the beginning of class, I referred to your, your desktop line scanner. Well, you can do the same thing in an aircraft where you can either use a continuous array of detectors or a staggered array of detectors like we just talked about, have some overlap between them. If you orient those uh, arrays perpendicular to your line of flight, then essentially what you've done is you've created a desktop scanner in the sky. Right? As you fly that array forward, you scan out a swath on the ground. Right? This is great. It does, I mean, you, you have a, if, you, um, if you restrict your view angle, your tangential errors are, are fairly minimal. Um, if you happen to have a, a, a roll in the aircraft, all the detectors move together, so they stay in a line all the time. So you have one less thing to have to, to worry about uh, correcting as far as geometry goes. Um, but the downside is now you have, let's say, 2,000 detectors. They have to be calibrated. So with a line scanner, you had a single detector or just a couple detectors that you needed to keep calibrated. Here you have thousands of detectors to get a, a swath across the ground. So what this does, with a line scanner, you can go, like we were saying, about plus or minus 60 degrees on the ground. With a push boom design, um, because you only have a limited number of pixels, let's say 2,000, 4,000, 8,000, somewhere around you know, that number, that's the number that you can project on the ground. That's all you have for a single line. So your field of view narrows if you want to keep your GIF of E high or low. Yeah, if you want to have small pixels on the ground, um, you have to reduce the size of your field of view. And so your swath needs to, to, to shrink. So they have no moving parts. You have no moving parts. So that's a very, very big um, advantage. So you have no moving parts. So, okay. all right. So some of some of the, the uh, you know commercially available uh, sensors uh, that you can use to spot series of satellites um, that's put up by France. Um, you know these these were push room scanners. They were the first push room scanners that, that got put into orbit for commercial use. Um, the GIF of these got small, right? But the field of views got narrow. Um, Iconos, QuickBird, you know, all the, all the sensors that you talk about now that are commercially available besides Landsat are pretty much all push boom designs. Okay. The, uh, the GI Alpha B um, on Iconos is down around the three meter level, and you know, the two meter level for QuickBird, and there's, the, there's even some commercial satellites up there that are approaching the one meter um, sorts of GI Alpha Bs up there. So from space at this point, you know, if you, if you take a look at this is a, uh, this one is QuickBird, this one is Iconos. 
Okay, so this is about three meters, it's about two meters. Um, if we went back to the Corona program um, that uh, National Photographic Interpretation Center and CIA used to fly um, back in the 60s, this was a film-based program. Okay, and that's what, these were the sort of resolutions, this is the Capitol in DC, these were the sorts of resolutions we were getting on film, you know, from state-of-the-art uh, 1960s, state-of-the-art spy satellites, right? And here's the sort of thing that you can now buy commercially from these, from these different detectors. So you're on about the same order of magnitude as far as resolution goes that we were able to get with film. And you know, you have to admit that film still is probably the optimal detector material as far as the spot size goes. Right? But I think at, at, at this point, um, you know, we're there. We're pretty darn close uh, from, from satellite altitudes with reasonable optics. All right, now, um, these two images, you can see, these are, these are from push booms. So this is an airborne push boom. So a non-stable system, this is an aircraft with roll within. So you can see that in this particular image, it's an aircraft tarmac. Um, so you have these big, uh, uh, eight, I think they're 18 foot by 18 foot squares of concrete typically on the ground. Um, and they're laid out in a grid pattern. But you can see some waves going through here. And you can see this particular line that the, the pilots will follow to, to go to their parking positions um, you know, aren't, aren't smooth. Right? That's because the aircraft was rolling as it was collecting. But you know, if you have the uh, inertial, navigation, inertial navigation system inside there, you can know the attitude of the aircraft. And you, again, just like a line scanner, you can correct everything else. All right, now let's um, let's take one more step, and now rather than a single linear detector, let's go to a framing one. And so go to a, C, a, a CCD or a CMOS uh, sort of detector. Now to collect um, color imagery or multispectral imagery, you, you need to filter. Okay, and in your commercial cameras, you filter right on the array itself. You have a single array. You filter on that array using a, a bear pattern. Right, where you usually you know, have a pattern that looks something like this, where you have a red filter, a green, set of green filters, and a blue filter. And if you look at this area right here, this two by two area uh, on the array, you have two greens, one red, and one blue. And then that pattern repeats over and over again. So you collect two green pixels for every one red and one blue pixel. And at this red pixel, you then can use the greens that surround it to interpolate a value to fall at that red location. And you can use the blues that surround it to interpolate to find a blue that falls at that location. But you wind up interpolating, so you wind up creating data. You know, so it, you're not necessarily going to be assured that you have good quality radiometry if you ever use just a, a um, single CCD or CMOS sensor that has a bear pattern sort of array on top of it. So definitely something you want to be aware of. Um, it works fine for your cameras, right? I mean. What's a typical array size now on a camera? 15 megapixels, 18 megapixels, 10 megapixels, 12 megapixels. When you're in that sort of regime, you have so many pixels that you never look at them all. Right? So commercial cameras work just fine because I can only still see the screen on my laptop is about 1,400 by 1,000 or something like that. That's one megapixel. Right? So I'm throwing 11 megapixels away to begin with. So I don't care if I don't interpolate very well. Right? It looks fine. Right? And for commercial photography, it, it works perfectly fine. But if you ever want to start to measure radiometry, at a particular point, I have a single target on the ground. It might be the size of a pixel. I want to make sure I get the right red, green, and blue at that location. And if I'm interpolating, I know right from the start I don't have the right values there. Right? So using these sorts of arrays for, for either scientific imaging or remote sensing imaging is, is, is very frowned upon. So what do you need to do? Well, you still want to collect the same um, on the same area on the ground, you want to collect the red, the green, and the blue simultaneously if you just want to do true color. Sort of degree. So you have to have a design that looks something like this, where you have your optical system, you come in, you collimate your light as you're inside your, your camera, you hit a fold mirror um, here that sends light to the uh, right over here, um, but let's not make it a fold mirror, let's make it a beam splitter so we can pass light through it also. So if I send half my light up here to a focal plane array that's filtered blue, and then I send half my light over here to another beam splitter, and pass half the light through 
to a focal plane which is filled with green, and then another one up here which is filtered red, well now I can collect three images simultaneously, one filtered blue, one filtered red, one filtered green. And by doing that, I now have a red, green, and blue pixel at each location on the ground. Provided what? Provided these mirrors and these arrays are aligned absolutely perfectly, right? So why do we send 50% of the light to the blue? Think about the silicon detector response function. That's where it's, that's where it's weakest, right? Green's where it's most sensitive, red where it's next sensitive. Right? So, so you want to send it out to blue first so you get good responsivity or good signal and noise across all your, your spectrum. All right, but now imagine putting this in a helicopter. What's going to happen to those mirrors? Everything's going to be shaking. Everything's going to get out of registration. And so this is a very hard design. While, while it's a very nice design, it's a very hard design to, to deal with. Roger um, actually has one, a camera that's designed like this. It's by a company called Red Lake, and he uses it for his um, his ancient document restoration work. And it's fine for that, right? If you're not in a, he's, he's in a nice, stable, well, he goes to some very funky places. <laughs> so, but I think most of the time, nothing's shaking, um, right? So he has a nice, you know, stable imaging uh, sort of condition that he could stay in. Uh, but that camera, you know, which is essentially just a glorified DSLR, you know, as far as resolution and everything goes, runs on the order of about 15,000, right? So to, to get this aligned and get the, the three detector arrays rather than one detector array in there just costs a lot. Um, so there are, there are cameras like this, but they're, they're few and far between. Um, all right, so let's see. Some pictures. Yeah, these are pictures from framing. <laughs> right, so this this is a uh, a visible image uh, from a frame array, and this is a midwave infrared image. Uh, so just some examples that you might see. This is a this is a Landsat three uh, image, and the color camera on the Landsat three was actually a video camera. Um, they called it the Return Beam Viticon um, camera, and and this was you know so fairly low resolution, but but from satellite altitudes, you know this was the kind of resolution that you were seeing on the ground, which was pretty good. Uh, for mapping sorts of problems. And, and you can compare that to the, the Landsat uh, MSS, where this was the, uh, the first whisk room scanner that we talked about, where we scanned all in the same directions. But the nice part between these two is this one, um, this one was a scanner, this one was a, a framing array, right? it was a video camera. Right? But you can see that you know, the roads are all lined up the same, so what, what do you gain when you go to a framing array over a scanning system? If you don't have a very well corrected geometrically scanning system, if those adjectives are in the right order, if you don't correct your scanning system very well geometrically, if you go and create maps from it, you can certainly have some errors. What's the advantage of collecting your entire scene at one time? Well, it doesn't matter if your aircraft's rolling, it doesn't matter if you're moving, all the pixels are where they should be. So geometrically, you're already registered. How many detectors do you have? You have millions. Now you've got to try and keep all those calibrated. Okay. So there's a trade-off. Good geometry, bad radiometry. Good radiometry, bad geometry. I'd say always do it in the middle. So always use a push room, but that has problems too. So you really, you really have to decide what your, your sort of application that you're, you're designing for. And that really should drive your design. You shouldn't go, well, you know, CCDs are, that's the newest thing out there, so if I'm designing a system, I'm going to put CCD in there. Um, may not be the right answer. And so you really got to think about how you want to use this thing in the long run. All right. So we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about um, other uses of framing arrays, too, because you can use framing arrays as push rooms to do hyperspectral collection. So think about that a little bit. We'll, we'll talk about that next time. So did you really send me that email at 4 o'clock this morning? No. Okay. Because <laughs> that was when it was time. I was like, oh boy. No. <laughs> All right. You didn't get it until 4 in the morning? Well, that's when it, that's when it was the, the time that was on it. Oh. Uh, no. Okay. <laughs> so, I have, um, everything's out on the site. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's on the site. Yeah, 
So right up there. So all the stuff for the second lab, um, like you said, is posted online. And just kind of a forewarning, this is the first time done like this particular lab, so I can almost guarantee there's going to be like something um, maybe missing or like not quite right in the in the handout or something. I've gone through like the actual process a number of times trying to match them up, but you know if you have questions about like just I don't think you know this is exactly what you have to do or it doesn't say something, just send me send me a quick email. So. I'll actually log on to the computer and kind of show you what it looks like. But so I just want to go through the handout really quick. There's a lot of information in here on Modran and then also what you have to do. So I just want to step through that and make sure it's all clear at least um, what you're trying to accomplish. So these are the files that you're going to need to pull off Carl's website. So there's a couple pieces of code that we're giving you to begin with, especially for the research computing. And then there's some scripting that you can do by self. You can do it yourself or you can choose to do it. Um, by hand. So the first thing in here just goes through uh, kind of what Modran is and how to use it. The inputs and the outputs are a little different. They're like very specifically formatted text files. So if they call them card decks and tape files, and you can read through this on your own to go through um, kind of how it is that you use that and what you need and all that sort of stuff. And then the output files um, are also very strictly formatted. And they're also called tape files, um, which goes like back to when they used to put them on um, like different tapes to be distributed. So it's a really old program and the naming conventions just have a change. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> that's, what I, that's what I used in high school. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so I just describe a little bit of the output here and and what you're going to need. So you should read through that, make sure you understand what's in all the files and stuff. So a lot of this lab, we're giving you um, a lot of exactly what you need to do. So in the handout, since I'm telling you, like click this button, use this file. Um, make sure you go through and explain and kind of illustrate that you understand like the radiometry behind it. So Matran is run, um, it lives in a Deers directory and it's run using like different Unix scripts. So what we're going to do is we're going to remote access the research computing machines and we're going to do all of our processing on there. So we're going to do the, mod the Matran runs on those computers and then you can either choose to do the processing on there as well. So they have IDL and they have MATLAB. Um, or you can pull your results back to your local machine or, or any machine that you use here, and then you can do your processing over here. So it's kind of up to you how you use those. You're going to have to be able to SSH or remote access the uh, research computing machines. And then you can choose to FTP your results back and forth or, or whatever you want. Um, and if you have questions with that, I, I definitely can try to help. Um, but you're going to need to use the um, X window. So you're going to have to be able to use uh, GUI and, and graphics. So I use Mac. I know there's Macs up in the reading room, um, so you can use those. But you're going to need an external window like this. And so I'm not really familiar with PC. So if you use a PC, I know you can get some sort of SSH client. You can also set up something called XMIG so that you can use your graphics. Um, if you know how to do that already, great. If you want to try to set that up on your own computer, fine. Uh, I can't be a lot of help with that, though. I don't really know too much about that. So if you want to try to use a PC, go for it. If not, just do the processing on a Mac, or do the mod train runs on a Mac. Like I said, you can get to them upstairs. You can pull up an extra window just like this and do everything that it says, and then kind of go from there. So how you do the processing is kind of, kind of up to you. So you're going to log on to one of these computers, and you're going to run Modran. So I go through here the different commands that you're going to need um, and kind of like give you an idea of what it's going to look like. You're going to use a GUI to uh, modify your files. So there's two different parts to the lab. The first part, we're just going to do two individual Modran runs. So you're just going to run Modran two different times. You're going to manually pull out the results. Um, you're going to be pulling out spectral data, so columns of data, and then you're going to create some plots. And the goal is to generate the sensor reaching gradient. So it explains in here um, what the output looks like, what you know, what output you're going to need, how you generate sensor reaching gradients from all that. So the first step is to log on to the machine, like it says here, and then this program 
this program here, the Tape 5 Edit, uh, is the GUI that you're going to use. So it's actually going to pull up a GUI, and you're going to be able to click on it, and it'll have um, it'll have how you can access all the different all the different inputs. And so here it tells you what you need to do to modify your Tape 5 file in order to put those inputs in there. So you're going to run ModTran twice, like I said. You need to be in the directory that contains your input file in order to run Modran. So you're going to go to that directory, you're going to run the command that says here, and then it'll create the output right in that same directory. And this tells you how to use the output to, um, to generate the results that you need. So this gives you all the different equations, everything that you're going to need, the files, um, and how to use them. So basically you need to read through this run ModTran twice, and then you're going to go in, you can pull out the results by hand, you can write a script if you want, you can do whatever you want, and then you're going to take those text files or those text results and put them into your program of choice. You can use IDL, you can use MATLAB. Um, this part you could really even do in Excel if you wanted to, and generate um, a number of plots. So you're going to end up, I think, with five different plots. Um, and I'd like to also see your take five file in your lab report. And then, um, the total, the integrated total radius. So this will end up with one number. So you have five plots, a single number. And then also um, just discuss, like I said, make sure you kind of try to illustrate that you understand the radiometry behind the plot. So don't just say like, you know, I use this column and this column to create this plot. Like, I already know that's what you did. That's, that's what the lab handout says. So like say like what it is, like what components it is, why you did that, that sort of thing. Okay. The second part is a little bit trickier. So this is the research computing part. So the first part's all just, just basic mod training and Unix, just getting used to that sort of thing. Um, I don't know about you guys, like, coming in, I never really used Unix before. Like, this was all completely new to me. So I definitely understand, like, if you don't even know how to change directories, like, neither did I, that's fine. One thing you can just, like, Google. I know it sounds like really stupid, but just like Unix and whatever you want to do, and it'll come up. So anything like change a directory, main directory, list the contents. Like, um, so I understand that for some people that might be a little bit of a leap, but the first part's all really basic. So it's really good to, to kind of figure that stuff out. So the second part. There are a few questions that just came up from the online. Can you repeat the questions? So the, um, the second part is the research computing. So the first part, like I said, we're trying to generate sensor reaching radiance so you can read through uh, all the inputs and the outputs and stuff like that. So I think, did you talk about this, the downwell in class at all? Yep. Okay. So for the first part... Um, well, I mean, we talked about how you integrate the... Oh, okay. The okay. So yeah, so the first part, you're going to go through and modify a bunch of different inputs to the tape 5 file, but they're basically, there's one input that changes between the two runs, but basically it's the same thing, so the same sensor geometry and all that. So to get to the downwell gradients, um, like you talked about, you have to do all the different angles in the hemisphere. So do something kind of cool, actually put the sensor on the ground, so normally your sensor's up here looking down and you try to figure out different things about the atmosphere. So what we're going to do for the downwell, we're actually going to flip it, and we're going to put the sensor so it's on the ground, and then we point it in every direction. And so since it's on the ground, the total radiance hitting the sensor is the downwell radiance because there's no reflection from the ground or anything. Your sensor's sitting there looking up. And so we point it in all the different directions and then you can integrate that to get the downwell radiance. Here. So Irradiance. Irradiance, sorry. You get the radiance from each direction, then we integrate when you integrate, you integrate out the radiance and you get your radiance. Mm -hmm. So um, that takes a number of different mod trend runs in order to get adequate sampling in every direction. So that's where the research computing comes in. So um, about seven samples in the zenith angle and 12 samples in the azimuth angle. So it amounts to 84 different 
my turn run. So even if it just took five minutes for my turn run, you'd be running for seven hours. And uh, depending on how fast your machine is, these can take anywhere from three or four minutes to 10 or 11 minutes. So um, I'm gonna go through the scripts on research computing of how we submit the different runs to the uh, scheduler in order to run all of those. And so the idea, rather than running them sequentially, what you're gonna do is you're gonna submit them to a, a computing cluster where it'll run 84 jobs simultaneously and you'll get everything back in hopefully 10 minutes as opposed to the seven hours. This is the script that you're going to be using. So actually, I can just, I'll show you this right now. So you can just log on here. You can log into the uh, LMC machine. So this is all, these lines of code are all like in the handout and stuff. What you're going to do is you're going to remote access something called the LMC machine, and that's a research computing machine. And the password is your RIT um, password, not your CIS password if you have no CIS account. So you can see I'm in my home directory. And here's my folder for the lab. So you can see I have an output folder, which I'll tell you about. And then I have these, um, these scripts here. So the first script is how you're going to loop through all your different variables. So I'm just going to walk through this really quickly. Um, a lot of this stuff you can go through and take a closer look, but you're just naming, um, it's like naming conventions so that everything's organized nicely, so you're naming your jobs, um, you're naming, you're creating an output folder, my trend payload is the script that contains uh, all the work, basically. So when you want to run like a large number of jobs, generally you want to like increment some sort of variable. So usually, like in our case, we want to increment the angles, and we want to increment two different angles. And if you're going to run a large number of jobs, especially in Modran, like, that's likely the case that you're going to be changing one variable a number of times. So we have two different for loops here. And you can see that we have the seven, um, seven zenith angles and 12 azimuth angles. And these are strings in this case because we're going to take them and put them into our take by file for the next script. So I'll show you that. But that's why they're formatted in that particular way. So you make your output directory here. Uh, you're building this other file called caseless, which I'll tell you about, name your output file, make your variables available, and then actually call your, your job file. So sbatch is the um, how you submit a job to the scheduler. So it's basically saying run this command, but submit it to the scheduler so that it can be um, distributed to all the different machines available in the research computing. So you can see here, job file is actually our payload script, so my friend payload, and that's what really does all the work. But you can see we've specified one sigma and one phi, so if we loop through that, we have 84 job file submissions. So let's look at that one. So the first thing, there's a bunch of comments to the scheduler. Um, it'll send you an email. So this should put your username there. If for some reason that doesn't work, you can just go in and change your change it to your username. It'll only send you an email if your job failed. So it could send you an email every time you submit a job, and then you get like hundreds and hundreds of emails. So if your job fails, it'll let you know. Um, it sends a it send it sets a maximum runtime. So here it's set for 12 minutes. Um, when I did this, it was taking maybe nine minutes per Modran run or so. If for some reason you're getting a lot of fails, you can try to increase this time. You can also try to increase the memory requirements for job. And then there's just like a debug partition and a word partition. So this puts them on the word partition. So this code at the bottom here is what we're really concerned about. So this first one here is we modify our input file. So I think this will make a little more sense once you actually go back and start looking at the files. But um, there's There are, um, you can see in here there's flags for 
the different the different variables. So this is what a take five file looks like. Like I said, it's very um, specifically spaced out. But you can see here there's two flags for the zenith angle and the azimuth angle. So what this does is it goes into that file, finds the flag for zenith and puts in your sigma, finds the flag for azimuth and puts in your feet, and then outputs it to the take five file in the appropriate directory. So what you're going to end up doing is building this output structure, kind of like a tree, where there's your output folder, a zenith angle, and then within the zenith angle, all the different azimuth angles. So then you go into that directory. So push D is kind of like CD. Like you move into that directory, you create a symbolic link for the data folder, and you actually run Montran, and then you pop back out of the directory. Um, there's a little bit more about these lines of code in the handout too, about creating that symbolic link and running Montran. So you do that in every single instance of sigma and feet. So if we look at my output here, can you see that? Okay. If I go into my output folder and I show the contents, you can see there's a folder for each zenith angle. And then if I go into one of those folders, you can see there's a folder for each azimuth angle. And then if I go into one of those folders, you can see that there is the symbolic link to data, the input file, tape 5, and all the different output files, tape 6, tape 7, tape 7, and tape 8. The two that we're going to be using are the tape 6. Well, the one that we're using for this particular part is the tape 6, and then tape 7.scan you use in the first part. This big long file here is something that's generated uh, kind of by the research computing script, so it's your standard error and your standard output. And those are good to look at if something goes wrong or they don't seem quite right. It shows you all the different things that would show up in your terminal while you were running this job. So the goal of this part is to create, uh, you want to know the downloaded irradiance from each of those each of those pairs of angles. So you're going to want to create a 3D plot. So it talks about in here, there's a single value. Like I said, because the sensor's on the ground, the downloaded radiance is the total radiance. So if you look in that tape 6 file, there's something called the integrated total radiance at the bottom. So you need to pull that value out of each of those files that lives within that tree. So you can do that manually, or you can try to write a script to do that. And then you want to create a three-dimensional plot um, that's going to end up looking something like that. So you're going to have kind of one uh, high point where the sun was, and then a, a contribution from each of the different angles. You can also integrate that to get the single downwell irradiance, which is this equation here. So you're going to need that plot and that value, and then again, a discussion of how you got where you're going. So just make sure you take a look at the rubric too. Um, you can see like the discussion accounts for like 25 points. So obviously you want to get the plots right and the numbers right, but it's also really important to tell me how you got there and if you understand like, what you're doing to get there. It's not a trivial plot to make. No. I mean, if, you, if you think about that, that's um. Uh, if you think about how the radiance as a function of the zenith and azimuth in the sky looks, it's going to get brighter as you get closer to the sun. So you're going to get this lobe coming out of the plot. And traditional plotting packages don't do that very well. So in this particular case, each of those squares is a quadrilateral connecting four vertices. And each of those squares is drawn one at a time to actually make that appear. There might be a better way to do that. Um, we also did it using a, a graphics format called a PLY file, um, and that worked nicely also. Uh, but you should be able to do this in MATLAB. Or this was done in IDL. Um, this is in Cartesian coordinates also. Yeah. So you're going to have a value for two angles. Um, so you have spherical coordinates to begin with. Right. So if you can if you can find a program that plots them in spherical coordinates, that's fine. But if you end up with axes like this that are labeled in Cartesian coordinates, that's okay too. So, I mean, it'd, it'd be really nice if you could put the axes on here, but in this case, like, these numbers on the axes don't don't mean uh, radiance values necessarily because they've been converted from spherical to a Cartesian. Oh, they're radiance values. Are they still radiant? Is it the same magnitude? Should be. Yeah, those the X, Y, and Z should all be radiant. And they're all identical. Right, all three axes are the same. 
guess the negative was like they didn't think it would. Yes, it's it, just it like should, back. It should, it's just like any other direction. Right. That's right. still the same. Yeah, if we could label them positive both sides, that would be good. Yeah. So yes, if anybody does find a spherical coordinate plotting program, um, we both like to know. Uh, but otherwise, yeah, just draw quadrilaterals in a 3D package and we that. Okay. There's there's a there is a variable where you can change the units but by default. So you can specify um, if it outputs by micron or by frequency or by wavelength, by micron or by nanometer. Um, every time I've used it though, I've always just used the watts per centimeter squared. So if you want to get to watts per meter squared, it's just a simple a simple conversion. But if you go from the top of the tape by tape six file, you can see there's it's quite long. So zero percent. There's just lines and lines and lines of results. But the number that you're looking for, um, as you just saw at the bottom. Any questions? Are we getting an email from Research Computing saying they made our accounts? Or Everybody who applied has an account. There's two people who didn't apply. I don't know who that is, but um, 11 accounts were made. That's all we. That's all the applications we had. So there's there's two folks who haven't applied yet. If you apply. Ralph said you would turn the account around pretty quickly. Yeah, okay. So if, if you did apply, though, you had an account there. Okay. And then does that see all the files and So when you log in, you can see you're at home and then your username. So that's your research computing account home directory. You can just FTP your files into there and you can do all your runs on there. Um, you'll see it's in it's detailed more in the handout, but this is like I, I just logged into the LMC machine, which is where you're going to do the two runs, so the, the large memory computer, so you can do all sorts of processing on that. To submit the, the um, batch script with all of those runs, you have to log into Tropos, which is a scheduler, and uh, that's only used for scheduling, so you shouldn't be doing processing on there. So you should log in, submit your runs, and then once they're done, if you still want to do processing, you need to log out and log back into the LMC machine. So all your processing should be done on the LMC machine. They don't like it when you process that. Yeah, if, if you're on the other one, don't be surprised if all of a sudden you're locked out. Yeah. Um, because th they will be busy. And it's not the end of the world. I've done no. it before. No. <laughs> but, uh, but they don't like it when you process on there because it's strictly, it's a really small computer. It's not very powerful. It's just for scheduling. And then it sends your jobs off to all the other computers. So this, while, while this sounds very complicated in the beginning, Monica put together these scripts, it would be very easy to do this, but what, what I hope you get in the end is, is the realization that if you have 100 slow computers as opposed to one really fast computer and you need to run 100 jobs, you're going to finish a lot quicker running one job on each of the slow computers simultaneously and get it back. And, and the scripts that Monica wrote for you, you can modify in the future to, to use for your particular problem that you have. So when your research comes along and all of a sudden you realize you have to do 9,000 runs of your code uh, like Monica needs to do, all of a sudden you, 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 you'll have something there that'll let you, you know, start and customize it to, to work for your particular uh, situation. Yeah, the looping script is definitely helpful. And also to the research computing, if any of you guys are familiar with your, your CIS account that you have here, if you have like a CIS account or a DIRS account or something like that, those are mounted on the research computing, so you can move back and forth. So like, um, if you look up here, like I just changed to my CIS home directory. So if you're familiar with using that, like you should all, if you have a CIS account, you have a 
an account like this, and you can also move back and forth between there. So your research computing accounts are going to be deleted after the class is over. So any files that you want to keep, you need to either have to ping your machine, or you can move them to your CIS account if you know where that is and if you've been using that. Um, something that you'll definitely start using once you start doing research and stuff like that. Like I said, I don't know how familiar everybody is with that, but you can get to those from the LMC machine. And if you need to use these again in the future, just as, as you applied um, just now, um, just apply again and they'll give you another account. The reason they're all going to get deleted is you're currently all associated with me as your advisor and working on a project, which is this class, which makes sense for this quarter, but after, afterwards you'll be assigned to different advisors, obviously. Any questions? You will have them. Yes. <laughs> so, don't, I, would, don't. I would suggest getting started. I'm sure I forgot to say something, like I said. I'm sure I probably forgot to put something in the handout, too, because this is the first time we've done this. So. Um, definitely try to figure out some stuff on your own as far as the Unix scripting goes and the mod train and stuff like that. But if you just get to a point where you're like, wait a second, then it just doesn't say, then just send me an email. I would guess that probably the whole class will be getting at least a couple yeah. over the course of this. But. And making that plot pretty much you and I independently trying to do it pretty much all day yesterday. Yeah. So we figured out how to do it finally. But, but the, the key is, in a 3D plotting package, plot a quad at a time. So plot a quad, and then overplot you know, on that another quad, overplot another quad. And it looks really cool as it will draw, too, you know, if you do it that way. That's, that's about the, the best way that, that we've ever done. So you don't have to like describe the files, but like I told you, like um, you know, you can take the like I described here these things here. So like the direct reflected radiance is this column, and um, you know, the path is this column, and then how you get to the total radiance. So basically, like describe what you input to get to the sensor region radiance, like this equation. You know, why you use it. So. The important part here is is. Matran has its own terminology. We describe the big equation here in class. How do you how do you use Matran to get the values for the big equation? That's that's what this is all about. That's a function way of them. Right. So your plots for the first part are going to be spectral. Over, over and then you're also going to incorporate a sensor spectral response function. So those are all given to you all matched up by band centers and stuff. You just have to So, so, like what I said, get going early just because you're going you're gonna to run into issues and then you find Monica anytime, right? <laughs> but preferably on Tuesday or Thursday. Oh yeah, your left up here in the floor, you can grab them. There's a rubric in uh, your reports on